She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another coffee and crime time. I want to apologize really quick because I get a lot of people in the comments lately saying like stop touching your glasses, stop moving your glasses. They definitely need to be adjusted. Like they are always falling down my face. Um, they, they've been needing to be adjusted for one month. I was going to say weeks, but it's definitely been months. I just don't have the time um, to like go to the store and get, get them adjusted. And I just hate going into stores and asking for like an adjustment, um, even when I'm not buying anything, you know, and I'm always like, can I give you like money to, to adjust my glasses? And then I always feel weird. And so it's just like a social anxiety slash uh, time constraint situation, but I will get them adjusted. In fact, I think I'm going to learn. I'm going to go on YouTube and learn how to adjust my glasses myself so I never have to worry about it again. Although I'll probably just end up messing them up, making them look incredibly crooked and then having to go into the store anyways. But yes, if I'm moving and adjusting my glasses a lot recently, it's just because they are sliding down my face constantly. It's mad annoying and um, I'm always trying to get them back up in the right position. So I'm sorry. I will work on it. I'll do it this week or this weekend, I promise. So today's video is a current and ongoing case. It has been heavily requested since it kind of popped up in the news. But as usual, I really am glad I waited a bit before talking to you about it because as I suspected, a lot more has come out just in this past week, like a lot more. In fact, major portions of the originally reported story have changed. So yay for waiting, yay for getting it right as right as we can, because I really have no idea what's going on in this case. I mean, I know what's going on in the case. I just, I'm super confused about it. On Saturday, July 29th, 2023, five people sat down together for lunch at the Leongata home of 48-year-old Aaron Patterson. I hope I pronounce things correctly. This does take place in Australia, and some of the words and places and things were harder to pronounce, but I think I did all right. So within 24 hours, four of these five people were sick with what was initially believed to be food poisoning. They were transported to the hospital, and by August 5th, three of them had sadly died. One was in critical condition awaiting a liver transplant. Now, it's been suspected that the beef wellington they'd consumed that day for lunch had been crafted with hand-picked mushrooms. But these are no innocent fun guys. <laughs> Get it? They're not fun guys at all. They're mean, toxic guys. Law enforcement believes that Aaron Patterson's guests' symptoms were consistent with the consumption of lethal death cap mushrooms, which are known to grow in the Victoria region of Australia in autumn. If that's true, the only question that remains is, did Aaron Patterson knowingly prepare lunch that afternoon with these deadly mushrooms? Or was it a tragic accident, a case of misidentifying the mushrooms that she picked and foraged? Now we're gonna go through the whole case, but first, Let's have a quick word from the sponsor of today's video, HelloFresh. If you would like to avoid finding deadly mushrooms accidentally in your cooking ingredients, HelloFresh can help you do that. I don't know if they can help you avoid having somebody purposely put them there, like 
the person may have done in the case we're talking about today. But accidentally, it's not going to happen with HelloFresh. Get mouthwatering seasonal recipes and fresh pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door with HelloFresh. HelloFresh makes cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable without the grocery stores and without the stressful meal planning. And then you can just cook for yourself instead of having somebody prepare a deadly beef wellington for you. HelloFresh will help you be more self-sufficient in preparing your meals. They give you everything and exactly what you need to prepare these wholesome, delicious meals. All the ingredients come pre-measured, so you only have exactly what you need for each meal you're making. It is honestly my favorite part because I hate portioning out. I hate buying a whole big thing of sour cream or a whole big thing of heavy cream when I just need half a cup of it. And then the rest of it just ends up going to waste. And then I feel bad because I wasted food. And then I have to clean out my refrigerator. And I feel bad about that because (laughs) nobody likes to do that. And best of all, the food's delicious. HelloFresh keeps your taste buds on their toes with 40 chef-crafted recipes to select from every week, from family-friendly meals to fit and wholesome meals. You'll always find new and exciting recipes to try and love. And I do find that if you have kids, um, no matter how young they are, well, obviously don't have, you know, a two-year-old out here chopping vegetables, but, you know, my kids are six, 11. uh, They are the perfect age right now to be helping me prepare the food. And any HelloFresh meal can become a family-friendly email if your kids are involved in the preparation of it because I find that when kids are hands-on with uh, making the food they definitely want to try it or they're more likely to try it and then they always end up liking it because it really just does taste good. The best part is sometimes you just don't have the time to spend an hour in the kitchen. Usually I don't. I know you guys don't either and that's why HelloFresh also has quick and easy dinner options as well as breakfast and lunch options and all you need is 15 minutes and this past Monday when I recorded Crime Weekly Derek and I record Crime Weekly every Monday night. My life was saved by HelloFresh because I was so busy that day and we go down at 8.30 to record. I didn't leave my office till 7 and usually my husband cooks when I'm working during the day, which is like weekdays. But for some reason he didn't. He had an appointment or something. He wasn't home and I left my office and the kitchen was cold and dark. There was no good smells coming from the oven or the stove and I was like, oh no, what do I do? Like I'm starving and I need to be down there in an hour and a half and I still haven't even done my makeup or brushed my hair yet. So I pulled out a HelloFresh meal and literally, I think it was 18 minutes between when I pulled it out of the refrigerator and when I was eating it and putting it in my mouth. And that is awesome. And it was so good. HelloFresh also has options for snacks, sides, and more that you can add weekly to your HelloFresh order. All you have to do is pick from a curated selection of over 100 add-on items. My favorite is their charcuterie board. It's delicious. And honestly, I hate putting together a charcuterie board, but I love to enjoy one. And I know we're all spending a lot of time and money in the store right now shopping for back to school. So take the food shopping off your list and let HelloFresh send you exactly what you need to prepare each of your meals. HelloFresh is also 25% cheaper than ordering out and it's less expensive than grocery store shopping as well and obviously way less annoying than grocery store shopping. Everything is way less annoying than going to the grocery store. I love HelloFresh. I've been cooking with them for years since early on in 2020 and I think that you'll love them too. So all you have to do to get started is go to HelloFresh.com and click the link in the description box and use code 50 Stephanie Harlow at checkout for 50% off plus free shipping. And this is one of the best deals, if not the best deal I've ever seen HelloFresh offer. So if you've been wanting to try them out, you're just kind of waiting for the right time. Back to school is the right time and this is the right deal. So all you have to do is click the link in the description box and use code 50 Stephanie Harlow at checkout for 50% off plus free shipping. Do not delay. Thank you so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in. Aaron Patterson grew up Aaron Scudder in the Melbourne suburb of Glen Waverly with her sister, who's now a trained geologist, and their parents, Heather and Hugh Scudder. And this is a very um, prolific family, actually, because Aaron's sister is, you know, a doctor, a geologist, and we're going to talk about her mother in a minute, who also has quite a reputation. Now, Aaron would eventually marry Simon Patterson, a Gippsland local and civil engineer who was also very passionate about photography as a hobby. And they would go on to have two children together who are now, at the time of this, this incident, both teenagers. Well, some sources say they're teenagers, some say they're 12 and 14, but regardless, 
you get it. That's not a super important detail to this story, but I do like to try and get things right. After getting married and having children, Aaron and Simon lived in Western Australia for a little while. They ran a bookshop together, and after that, they lived in Quinnup, I believe it's called, which is south of Perth, and it's supposed to be a very kind of rural, isolated region. And then they returned to the East Coast, to Corumburra, at which point they began running a local newspaper called the Burra Flyer Newsletter, previously run by Simon Patterson's parents, Gail and Don Patterson, two people who also end up being two of the four people that passed away after that July 29th lunch. Now, from what I can tell, Aaron edited the newsletter while Simon took pictures for it. And during this time, they occupied a beautiful home with their children in Leongata. Uh, It's been described as sort of like a personal paradise. It has its own creek, an over two-acre garden. It's resplendent with wildlife of all kinds. They said there was like koalas in their garden sometimes, all sorts of birds, butterflies, you know, the whole nine. So it seemed like Aaron and Simon had the picture-perfect life, but in the spring of 2022, after suffering from a severe, mysterious gastrointestinal sickness that left Simon Patterson in an induced coma for 16 days, something seemed to shift, and the couple separated. They kind of went their own ways. Simon began living with his parents in Currumburra. Now, something you need to know about Aaron Patterson is that it appeared she was independently wealthy after making some smart real estate and financial investments, which left her with the ability to not have to work and she could be a stay-at-home mother. Now, Aaron's mother, Dr. Heather Scudder, she'd been a well-respected professor at Monash University where she lectured in 19th century adult literature. She also wrote articles reviewing children's books. She was considered an expert in children's books. And when she died in early 2019 at the age of 72 from cancer, she'd left her two daughters a gorgeous gorgeous property in Eden on the South Pacific Ocean. And this is like oceanfront, ocean view, beautiful property, and it ended up selling for $900,000 four years ago. Erin took this money from the sale, her portion of it, and she purchased several more houses and properties, including a $931,000 villa in Mount Waverly, right around the corner from where she'd grown up, and a three-bedroom house in Corumbora, where she, Simon, and their two children lived for a time before it was sold last year. Erin also purchased land in Leongata, which is in South Gippsland, where she would eventually build a two-story home. And this is where she was living alone and with her children at the time of the incident this past July, while her estranged husband Simon was occupying a separate residence in Corumbora just 15 miles away. Now, initially, we were told that the split between Simon and Aaron had been amicable. However, it has recently been reported that the whole reason this lunch had been set up in the first place was because Aaron wanted to reunite with Simon, try to work it out. But according to a close family friend who didn't want to be named, Simon didn't necessarily want this and neither did his family. They kind of felt that Aaron, I guess, wasn't good enough for Simon. That was the impression that that at least Aaron got. And she was going to try to prove to them and convince them that she could be good for him, that she wanted to do the right thing, that she wanted this to work. And listen, whatever it is that Aaron Patterson did or did not do, I can empathize with this. The in-law relationship is always one of the hardest ones that anybody will have to navigate and maneuver in their lives. And if it's not if it's not good, if it's not, you know, amicable, if it's not copacetic, it can be incredibly stressful and leave you feeling sometimes inadequate. So the guests that Aaron Patterson had for lunch that day were Simon's parents, 70-year-old Gail Patterson and 70-year-old Don Patterson, along with Gail's sister, 66-year-old Heather Wilkinson, and her husband, 68-year-old Ian Wilkinson. And Ian was a pastor in Corumbora, and apparently Ian was present because this lunch was supposed to be a church-mediated gathering, or intervention, if you will, with Ian acting as the mediator. I believe that what they wanted to do was tell Aaron, you know, this isn't going to work out. This isn't what we think is best uh, for you and Simon to reunite. So we're going to try to convince you of that at this point. Now, the family friend who's given us insight into what was to be discussed that afternoon said, quote, 
The people who died were talking to them because they're heavily ingrained with the church, and they wanted to make sure she was right to resume a relationship with Simon. She was basically petitioning to get back with him, and the family didn't think it was the right move, end quote. Now, Simon Patterson was also supposed to be present for lunch at his estranged wife's home that day. I should hope so, considering it is ultimately his decision as to whether or not he gets back together with her, and I'm not sure why his parents and his aunt and uncle have to be present or involved in that decision at all. But anyways, I digress. At the last minute, Simon canceled for reasons unknown. Now, once again, some reports say he canceled at the last minute. Erin Patterson herself has recently come out and said it wasn't really the last minute he let her know the day before that he wasn't going to be there. But regardless, he was not there that afternoon. And initially, it was reported and we were told that Simon and Erin's two children were at the house that day for lunch. But it has since been revealed, or at least told to us by Aaron, that the two kids left to go see a movie before the main course was served. So they were not there to consume the beef wellington, which is, I will say, convenient. And it's like if they're if they're teenagers or if they're 12 and 14, as it's been reported, even if they're under the age of 16 or even under the age of 18, like who brought them to the movies, right? You can't send a 12 and a 14-year-old to the movies by themselves. You can't um, expect them to drive themselves there. They can't probably be there by themselves. So who took them to the movie? Has it been confirmed that they went to a movie? Those questions are not answered. Now, in early reporting, it was a mystery what meal was served by Erin, or if the meal even contained mushrooms at all. She wouldn't comment on what she'd cooked that afternoon when she was talked to by reporters later on. We've recently found out that Erin cooked beef wellington for her guests, a dish that features mushrooms heavily and is also very, very delicious, usually, maybe not this afternoon. Now, that day after lunch, all four of Erin's guests started to feel ill with stomach pains, nausea, and vomiting. And on Sunday, July 30th, as their condition began to deteriorate, they were all admitted to the hospital to be treated for food poisoning, right? Because that's initially what they thought they had. On Friday, August 4th, Gal Patterson and her sister Heather Wilkinson sadly passed away. The next day, Don Patterson also died, leaving only Ian Wilkinson alive, fighting for his life on life support and in critical condition. And that's when law enforcement came out and announced that they suspected Gail, Don, Heather, and Ian were not suffering from food poisoning at all. They had been exhibiting symptoms of death cap mushroom poisoning. And fun fact, death cap mushrooms are actually responsible for 90% of lethal mushroom poisonings globally. And that's because they can look pretty benign if you don't know what you're looking for. Now, it's said that a chunk of this mushroom the size of a coin is enough to kill a human being. And BBC.com reported, quote, as foraging expands in popularity, death caps are increasingly mistaken for edible fungus. They are found in cool, humid climates all over the world and look far more innocent than a lot of other deadly varieties, end quote. And like that article said, these mushrooms look innocent enough if you aren't an experienced forager, but they are a silent assassin, and to this day, there's no known antidote. With only a small amount needed to kill someone and with the symptoms not always appearing immediately— Sometimes it can take hours for people to start feeling the effects. Death cap mushrooms have been used in nefarious plots for centuries. Uh, They were used by the Greeks and Romans as reliable methods of taking out their inconvenient enemies in a less obvious way. Native to Europe, death caps were first confirmed to be found in Australia in the 1960s, and they almost always grow near trees, especially oak trees. In 2020, a series of death cap poisonings in Victoria put eight people in the hospital, and they all later passed away. So I guess it's not abnormal or impossible for a person to accidentally consume a death cap mushroom, believing it to be a non-poisonous mushroom. But according to those who knew her, Erin Patterson was no fun guy novice. Erin was an experienced mushroom forager who often picked mushrooms with her family when they were in season. And a family friend also claims that Erin had a collection of books about mushrooms, including books about delicious yet deadly mushrooms. 
On Saturday, August 5th, a week after the fateful lunch, police were seen searching Aaron Patterson's home and removing multiple items. The following day, four police officers returned to Aaron's home to question her, and neighbors reported hearing her wail inside, very loudly, wailing, like, ah, inside, after these four police officers left. And the following day, Dean Thomas, who's the Victoria Police Detective Inspector for the Homicide Squad, he confirmed that Erin was a suspect, not only because she prepared the meal, but because she had been the only one to allegedly consume it who had not fallen ill, although Erin herself would dispute this in a later statement. She would say she had gotten sick. But I think it is safe to say out of the five people who consumed the beef wellington that day, if she even allegedly did consume the beef wellington, She was the only one who didn't die or become very close to dying, right? Because Ian Wilkinson made it, but barely, barely. And I mean, he has to be hooked up to machines. He's still waiting for a liver transplant. If he can't get a liver transplant, obviously that's not going to be looking good for him. So he almost died. And we know that she didn't almost die. So that, that is saying something. Detective Inspector Dean Thomas said, quote, We have to keep an open mind in relation to this. It could be very innocent. But again, we just don't know at this point. Four people turn up and three of them pass away with another in critical. So we have to work through this. End quote. Erin Patterson briefly spoke to reporters waiting outside her house proclaiming her innocence, but refraining from giving any details about what it was she had cooked, if she'd used mushrooms in the meal, or where she would have gotten the mushrooms from. She was very evasive with those questions. It's a tragedy what's happened. Can you tell us about the meal that you cooked? I'm so devastated by what's happened, by the loss of Don and Don is still in hospital, the loss of Ian and Heather and Gail. They were some of the best people that I've ever met. Gail was like... Take your time. Gail was the mum that I didn't have because my mum passed away four years ago and Gail's never been anything but good and kind to me. And Ian and Heather were some of the best people I've ever met. They never did anything wrong to me. And I'm so devastated about what's happened. Can you tell us? And the loss to the community Mm. and to the families and to my own children who've lost their grandmother. Can Can you tell us a bit more about the lunch? What I can tell you is that I just can't fathom what has happened. I just can't fathom what has happened. That Ian and Heather have lost their lives and Gail has lost her life and Donna's still in hospital and I pray, I pray that he pulls through because my children love him. And you must be pretty shaken up by this as well. I'm devastated. I love them. And I can't believe that this has happened and I'm so sorry that they have lost their lives. How are you but I just can't believe it. I just can't believe it. Can you tell us where the mushrooms came from? Police say you're a suspect. Do you have anything to say about yes, that? Yes, I say I didn't do anything. I love them. And I'm devastated that they're gone. And I hope with every fibre of my being that Don pulls through. That's where what did I have the mushrooms to say. come from? Were they picked by you or where did they come from, Mary? Can you tell us? What meal did you cook them? Did you eat the same meal, Mary? Now, it was noted during this interaction slash interview that Aaron mistakenly said she hoped Don would pull through when, in fact, Don Patterson, her father-in-law, had already died, and it was Ian Wilkinson who was in critical condition. It was also revealed that Aaron had given a no-comment interview to law enforcement, which she would later claim she regretted. 
and she had only done that based on advice she'd been given by a lawyer who no longer represented her. I don't know if I actually believe this. There's a lot of weirdness going on with Erin and her lawyers. Like one day she said she was leaving the house. She told the reporters she was leaving the house to go see her lawyer. And then this was at like 10 a.m. And then by 5 p.m., her legal firm was at her house to hand deliver a letter to her. And she wasn't there and no one could find her and no one knew where she was. So I just don't know if I believe that a lawyer told her it's going to be in your best interest to not talk to the police when they suspect you of purposely poisoning your in-laws. I just don't know if a lawyer would have done that, but they could have. And at this point, I'm actually going to jump ahead a little bit to August 11th so we can discuss the statement from Erin, which she finally gave to the police. But it was also, (laughs) strangely enough, leaked to the media, like either at the same time that she gave it to the police or very shortly after. And Erin claims, um, she claims she did not leak it. She denies leaking it. But I feel like if anybody did, it was her. And that's just my theory. The police have been incredibly, incredibly um, closed off about giving details in in regards to this case. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to give even their opinion. They keep saying like, yeah, it could have been on purpose. It could have been an accident. We just got to look at the evidence and wait and see. They're really not revealing anything. So why would anybody inside law enforcement leak this statement? And in general, this statement does seem like Aaron is talking to the general public as opposed to the police. It does seem like she's trying to clear her name. And why would you? I mean, I guess you want to clear your name to the police, right? But but also, if you felt you were being tried in the court of public opinion, as Aaron has said multiple times she does feel, you might want to get your story out to the general public. So hopefully they back off um, or or they're confused enough between what's true and what's not true so that they reserve their judgment, which they should be doing anyways. Now, in this statement, Erin gives her version of events of what happened on July 29th and in the days following. And we are going to talk about that. But she also spent a good amount of time reminding everyone how much she loved the victims and how hard things had been on her since the incident had happened. Once again, this is why I think that she did leak it, because why would you be telling the police, like, I loved them, I love them so much? So she said, quote, I am now wanting to clear up the record because I have become extremely stressed and overwhelmed by the deaths of my loved ones. I am hoping this statement might help in some way. I believe if people understood the background more, they would not be so quick to rush to judgment. Sidebar, people. People understood the background more. Is that something you would say in a statement to law enforcement? Or is that something you would say in a statement that you knew was going to be leaked to the public, the very people it sounds like you're talking to? Okay, back to the statement. She continues on saying, I am now devastated to think that these mushrooms may have contributed to the illness suffered by my loved ones. I really want to repeat that I absolutely had no reason to hurt these people whom I loved, end quote. Yeah, so... What do we see here in the statement? A lot of uh, reassurances to towards us that she loved the, the three people who died and, and the one person who is sick. She loved these people. Love, 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 love. Remember, I loved them. I loved them. I would never hurt them. A lot of that and also a lot of, you know, like, this is so hard on me. And I typically don't like to see that in statements right off the bat from people who are suspected in being part of, you know, a a murder crime because it takes away from the victims the fact that three of them are dead, one of them is in critical condition, needs a new organ, and you're just talking constantly about how stressed you are because of what's happening, how you're being, you know, hounded by the media, how the public thinks you're evil, this, this, and that. It's all about you, all about you, all about you. That reminds me of Letitia Stouck. That reminds me of somebody who is kind of defensive because if you had nothing to do with it, you'll know that the truth will come out. Everything will work itself out and then people will back off and it's going to suck for a couple weeks or a couple months or however long it takes. But, you know, three people lost their lives. One's critically ill and you got to let the investigation kind of figure out what happened to them. And if you loved them, you would want the truth about their deaths and, and illness to come out. So I just don't really like that. I don't think it's a good look. The defensiveness, the focused on oneself and what you're going through when three people are dead. 
So Erin said that on July 29th, she prepared her beef wellington with a mixture of dried mushrooms she'd purchased from an Asian grocery store in Melbourne months prior, as well as fresh button mushrooms she'd recently purchased from a local supermarket. She said, quote, I used the dried mushrooms as they had been in my cupboard for some time and I wanted to use them up. I rehydrated them and put them into the dish with the mushrooms that I had bought at the supermarket, end quote. Erin also said that she had brought the dried mushrooms from the house that she had previously lived in in Kurumbura to the house in Leongata. And at the end of the day, I think if we're looking at any culprit for what what could have happened with these mushrooms, were they poisonous mushrooms, we're not going to be looking at these fresh button mushrooms. We're going to be looking at these dried mushrooms. Now, Erin also claims she did consume the meal. She said she plated everything up. She allowed her guests to choose their own plates, and then she took the last plate remaining. After lunch, Erin claims she was sick. She started feeling very ill, just like her guests. So she went to the Leongata Hospital complaining of stomach pains and cramps and diarrhea. And like her guests, she thought she had food poisoning. And she claims she was put on a saline drip, given a liver protective drug, and kept overnight before being sent home the next day. Two things about this. Several media sources have reported that the first time Erin went to the hospital, she wasn't admitted at all. So once again, we don't really know if what she's saying is true. The second thing about this, these claims she's making, which have stuck out to me, is she says that after she was sent home from the hospital the next day, which would have been July 30th, she prepared the leftover beef wellington for her two children. However, she said she scraped off the mushrooms because she claimed her kids don't like mushrooms. And this begs the question, if you thought you and your guests had food poisoning, if you all had to go to the hospital because you were suffering from these horrible, you know, gastrointestinal symptoms and you had to be put on a saline drip and get like a liver protective medicine, why would you serve the last meal that any of you ate to your own children? Why, why would you do that? And if you did and you scraped the mushrooms off, it kind of maybe seems like you knew that the problem was with the mushrooms. But I don't think that she gave her children that beef wellington. And if she did, I believe it was prepared separately and differently than the main lunch. This is my opinion. Now, there's also the matter of the food dehydrator. Remember, Erin said she used the dry mushrooms and she rehydrated them and then put them in with the button mushrooms for the beef wellington. But police recovered a food dehydrator that had been thrown out at a local dump on Friday, August 4th. And initially, Erin had told the detectives that, yes, it was hers, but she'd thrown it out months prior. However, in this statement, she admitted to lying to police. Allegedly, she claims while she was at the hospital, I think it was that first day when she went in on July 29th, her children and her estranged husband, Simon, were also there. And she, for some reason, was discussing the food dehydrator with her children. And then Simon, her husband, cut in suddenly and asked, is that what you used to poison them with? And he's obviously referring to his parents and his aunt and uncle. And this caused Aaron to panic. That's what she says. She says she panicked. She worried that she would lose custody of her children if Simon or the police thought that she had poisoned her lunch guests intentionally. So on July 31st, she got rid of the dehydrator at the dump just the day after everyone started to get really sick. And Simon Patterson, her estranged husband, he could have been suspicious of meals cooked by his wife because, as I mentioned earlier very briefly, he had fallen sick in May of 2022 after eating some food prepared by his wife Erin. Simon posted about this mysterious illness that doctors could not diagnose on Facebook, saying, quote, I collapsed at home, then was in an induced coma for 16 days, through which I had three emergency operations, mainly on my small intestine, plus an additional planned operation. My family were asked to come and say goodbye to me twice, as I was not expected to live. I was in intensive care for 21 days, after which I was in the general ward for a week, and now I'm at a rehab place since last Saturday, end quote. And this was a, a long recovery period. And um, it's, once again, it's confusing because family friends of Simon and the Pattersons say that it was after Simon 
was sick like this that he sort of separated from his wife, Erin. But Erin claims that after he was released from the hospital and from rehab, she let him live with her so she could take care of him for two weeks. And then at that point, she told him like, oh, this isn't working. You know, I I definitely want to be separated. And that doesn't really make sense. First of all, it's kind of messed up. Like he's, he's sick and you're like, oh, I'll take care of you for two weeks, but then I want you out. And secondly, if that was the case and she was the one who wanted the separation to begin with, why would she be trying to reunite? night with him a few years later. I mean, I guess it's possible, but it just doesn't seem in her statement that she gave about taking care of him, it doesn't seem like she really had much respect or love for him, in my opinion. She was kind of like really dismissive and cold about it. Like, I took care of him for two weeks. It was very hard. Simon also wrote on Facebook that he was feeling better, he was no longer in pain, and he was rebuilding his fitness after spending so much time bedridden, and he looked forward to his wife and children visiting him later that afternoon at the rehab center. Now, in Erin's statement, she claimed that on Monday, July 31st, presumably after throwing out the food dehydrator, she returned to the hospital, and at that time, she was transported by ambulance to Monash Medical Center in Melbourne, where she was treated for poisoning. Now, the Gippsland Southern Health Service did confirm that a fifth person, besides the three people who died and the one person who is awaiting a liver transplant, had gone to the Leongata Hospital on July 30th with suspected food poisoning, And that person returned later and was sent to Monash, but they do not say what she was treated for. They don't say if she was taken there by ambulance, things like that. So we know that Erin probably did go into the hospital twice complaining about gastrointestinal symptoms, complaining about possibly being worried about being poisoned or having ingested poison. However, we don't know if she actually was suffering from poison. We know that she's not on life support. She's not awaiting a new kidney. She's not dead. So how bad could it have been? Did she just have less mushrooms in her beef wellington? I don't know. Erin also has claimed in her statement that the Department of Health had contacted her and asked what she thought may have caused such a violent reaction in her guests after they ate her food. And she stated that she preserved what was left of the beef wellington and she gave it to the hospital toxologists for examination. Police are also performing tests on the food dehydrator to see if there's any trace of these death cap mushrooms on the food dehydrator that Erin probably used to prepare that meal and also definitely suspiciously threw in the dump just a day or two after. Erin also has said that she's told the police where she purchased the button mushrooms from, but she wasn't exactly sure where she'd gotten the dried mushrooms from since it had been in Melbourne and it had been months prior. It had been so long ago. Um, Then this is once again convenient because I have no doubt that she had recently purchased mushrooms from the store. And if you, let's just say she was planning on killing her lunch guests and she wanted to poison them, you wouldn't just use poisoned mushrooms, right? You'd mix them in with some other mushrooms, mushrooms that are not poisonous so that you can show law enforcement like look this is where I bought the mushrooms from and they're from the store and if they were poisonous it's not my fault. Now the Australian Mushroom Growers Association responded to this because it kind of did feel like Erin was saying she might have accidentally had a death cap mushroom slipped in with whatever mushrooms she purchased from the store and, and they were not having that. They said there's no way poisonous mushrooms could be grown in commercial farms and they stated quote this fungus only grows in the wild. Commercial mushrooms are grown indoors in environmentally controlled rooms with strict hygiene protocols and food safety standards. The only mushrooms you can be sure are safe are fresh, Australian-grown mushrooms bought from a trusted retailer, end quote. Kind of felt like a marketing campaign there towards the end, right? And to to be honest, I did some research on this, and I couldn't find any poisoning cases where somebody had purchased a death cap mushroom from a store. They always happened because people are going out, foraging, picking mushrooms, wild mushrooms, thinking that they're, they're fine and then accidentally poisoning themselves and the people around them. So Erin, who had nothing to say for quite a while, has become very vocal now about how her life has been interrupted based on several media outlets parked outside her house for weeks at a time, leaving her feeling very isolated because none of her friends, who she claims 
are wanting and willing to support her, they won't come to visit her because they don't want their face in the news. She said, quote, I lost my parents-in-law, my children lost their grandparents, and I've been painted as an evil witch. And the media is making it impossible for me to live in this town. I can't have friends over. The media is at the house where my children are at. The media are at my sister's house, so I can't go there. This is unfair, end quote. So first of all, I don't know if her children are actually living there. It was reported early on that they'd been taken in um, by children's services just to be safe. I don't know if they were returned to her since, but I think it's funny that Aaron would use the word witch in this statement because in another twist of events, a contractor who was hired to do some work on Aaron's Corumbura home last year, he's come forward with some really weird bizarre, out of nowhere, disturbing information. And like, you can't make this shit up. So the year prior, Simon and Aaron were fixing this house up to sell because they had been living there together, but now they were separated. So they were going to sell the house. And this contractor claims that he was hired to remove graffiti from an interior wall inside the house. It was a wall in the dining room because, you know, Aaron and Simon wanted to fix the house up, get it ready to sell. And with this particular graffiti, that would have probably been a little difficult. Because when the contractor got there and saw what he was supposed to be removing from the wall, he was shocked. He took pictures. Um, I couldn't find these pictures anywhere. Maybe by the time this video goes public, they will be out there to be seen. But um, a, a couple media outlets that reported it said they have seen the pictures. So we kind of know that they do exist. But this guy who took the pictures, like, he was shocked. And he said, quote, it was disturbing. We call it the death wall. They were done by their daughter. It's pretty disturbing for a mom to let her kids draw on their dining room wall, end quote. Okay, so what were these pictures and words and stuff on the wall? Reportedly, they were poster-sized drawings. Um, there was words and phrases and and everything on this wall has been described as disturbing, which we've already said, but also as satanic. The drawings feature two tombstones with daggers and decapitated heads, along with red and black scribbles and quotes like, you are dead by the sword. There was also another one that had the date August 1st, 2017 written, and then underneath that it said, you will die within a year, along with the ominous statements of R.I.P. Grandma and R.I.P me. Now, how does this fit in with the case? I have no idea. It's a little, it's a little crazy because did Simon and Aaron's daughter make these drawings and statements? Um, I mean, RIP grandma would suggest that it was one of the kids who did it, but it's just scary and weird because grandma would end up passing away a few years after these drawings were allegedly made. If you consider that they were all made in 2017, like the date says. So it makes me wonder what was going on in that house. Now kids can sometimes just be weird and morbid. I was. I definitely wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have made tombstones and decapitated head pictures on the walls of my parents' house. I would have been murdered. It would have been me um, who was dead and, and RIP'd at that point. If I had done that, it would have been my blood all over the walls that uh, a contractor would have found later. And he said it took him six coats of paint to cover all of this stuff up. So it's definitely disturbing. And I don't know where it fits in, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it doesn't fit in. So the police have not commented on Aaron's statement as far as, you know, confirming or denying certain things she said in it, which I'm not surprised that they're they're not going to do that. And they also said this was not a statement that was taken by a police officer. It was a statement that was like written by her and then probably sent to them, but also, like I said, leaked to the public. There was also something else random that I found um, that Simon Patterson had said about his wife, Aaron several years back. So remember that photographer, Kevin Bader, he took pictures of his girlfriend Maggie every week for a year and then he like put them together in a project well Simon who once again is a passionate um, hobby photographer he commented on this project on a photography site called fstoppers.com in April of 2018 and he said quote my wife hates having her picture taken the fact that I am alive to write this comment is testament to the fact I haven't attempted what the guy in this article did end quote I always find it odd 
and bizarre when spouses joke about the other spouse killing them. You know, like, oh, she would kill me if I did this. Oh, like, happy wife, happy life, alive husband kind of thing. You know, like, that's – do you feel like she's capable of killing you? Like, is that something, you know, that you think she could possibly do? Because that's a concern. And uh, I guess there was a 2015 picture on Erin's Instagram, and it was just of her feet and, like, the bottom of her legs. And Simon commented on this picture, saying underneath it, like, this is the closest you've ever come to a selfie. So I don't know. I don't know what any of that means, but it seemed they had kind of an odd, a little bit tension-filled relationship. Like, maybe they didn't understand each other that well towards the end there. I would also like to mention that the police have said at this point there have been no recalls on mushrooms and no one else in the last few months have reported any poisoning related to mushrooms. So if there was a death cap mushroom accidentally slipped into the mushrooms that Aaron purchased at the Asian grocery store in Melbourne months ago or the local grocery store just before the lunch, she was the only one who got one. Nobody else did. So the police have obviously simply said that Erin Patterson is a suspect, a person of interest. She has not been arrested. She is not in custody at this time. But experienced psychologist Tim Watson Monroe has said that in his examination of the case, he's seen several red flags that he feels needs to be investigated, which I'm sure the police are because I'm sure they're seeing the same red flags. And he said, you know, some of these red flags are the fact that Simon Patterson was was invited to the lunch, but he pulled out at the last minute, and that Simon Patterson spent, you know, 21 days in the ICU after collapsing from a mysterious stomach illness in May of 2022, and his symptoms were very similar to a poisoning. The fact that Aaron lied to the police about the food dehydrator, the fact that she tried to get rid of the food dehydrator, the fact that she claims she had all of the same symptoms as her guests who fell sick, yet she is still alive and not waiting for a new organ. And there was also another uh, thing that I read in some of these media outlets, I think just two articles I read it in, but it was very vague. Um, it didn't really give a lot of specifics, but I think it is important. So one of the paramedics who was with one of the victims before they died had gone to the police because he thought it was very important that the police knew what the last words of one of these victims were. So what could be that important as far as last words go that this paramedic wanted the police to know. Most likely, I think we can all agree in in theory, I'm not saying this is true, that this person, whoever it was, whether it was Gail or Don or Heather, said that they believed Aaron had poisoned them. They believed that Aaron was responsible in some way. And that is very telling because according to Aaron, she had a great relationship with her in-laws. She had lost her own parents. Her mother died in 2019. I believe her father died from cancer the year prior. And so she felt that these were, you know, her surrogate parents, that Don and Gail Patterson acted as her parents and they were very close. And she said, yes, since the separation between Simon and myself, things have been a little bit more difficult. We don't see each other as much, but I still loved them. It was a very good relationship. But I also wonder how you can have such a close, loving and good relationship with your in-laws when you know that your in-laws don't really want you to get back together with your husband, don't really think that you're in the right headspace to do so, um, don't maybe think you're good enough to be with him. Like, how could you really feel warmly towards people like that? It seems more likely that there would be some animosity. Now, that brings us to the motive. Like, even if there was animosity, even if Aaron and her father and mother-in-law had the worst relationship and hated each other, what would be her motive to kill them, right? Usually we'll see that it could be financial. Did the Pattersons have something that Aaron could stand to gain? It doesn't seem like that would be the case because Aaron herself has, you know, a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio. She's doing very well. She has more to lose by killing them than she has to gain in this moment. So was it just basically a hatred? Was it just a, I want to poison them, I want them dead, I'm so angry at them, if that's what happened? And of course, I'm not saying that Aaron Patterson purposely poisoned her in-laws at all, because I wouldn't know that. I hope that that's not what happened. But I will say I would be leaning more towards 
the fact that she did it on purpose simply because of the lies, the changing stories, getting rid of the food dehydrator. Oh, I don't know where I bought those dried mushrooms from. It all seems super suspicious to me. And once again, that would lead me to say that there doesn't really seem to be a financial motive. Was there some threat to the custody of her children that the Pattersons posed? I don't know. That would be the only other motive I could think of. Other than that, it just seems like the motive would be to want them to be dead, want them to not be around anymore. Maybe she felt like they were interfering with her chances of reuniting with Simon. I don't know. We know that historically throughout time, many women have used poison to kill. And that's simply because it's just a more um, passive kind of you know, under the radar way of taking someone out. They don't need physical strength. They don't need to be direct or confrontational about it. And especially in times when women had far less power, far less status in society, it was just their way of, you know, taking care of situations. Like if you're married and this person is abusing you and, you know, the time you live in doesn't even allow you to get a divorce or get away from this person, you know, he might find himself dropping dead after eating breakfast one morning. So the Washington Post reports that men commit many more murders than women. Men commit about 90 percent of murders and this data is collected through the FBI Supplemental Homicide Report from 1999 through 2012. In their murders, men use guns two-thirds of the time. Women use guns less than half of the time, although it does still remain the most popular weapon among women. But after guns, women are likely to use a knife or to beat their victim to death with a blunt object. After guns, poison is the sixth most common way for women to kill. This article goes on to say, quote, still, because men use guns for so much of their killing and because women use guns much less frequently, it turns out that women tend to use every other weapon more than men. And so, yes, poison is more popular among women killers than it is among men. Still, poison is not a very popular weapon. It is used in just under one half of 1% of murders. That's using a definition of poisoning that includes standard poisons and also murdering with poisonous use of narcotics or sleeping pills. It does not include poison gas, which the FBI lumps under asphyxiation, end quote. And I think that probably the incidences of poisoning in general have gone down because we have, you know, toxicology tests and things like that now. It's just much harder to get away with a poisoning and making it look accidental, which is why you'd want to poison somebody to begin with, to make it look accidental. Like, I have no idea what happened to them. And back in the day when they didn't have as thorough of toxicology or they weren't doing autopsies and if someone died, it was just like, oh, they died. Like, we don't know why. It was just much easier to get away with that. However, something like death cap mushrooms, those could be slipped into somebody food and you could still argue and have, you know, the benefit of the doubt that this could have been an accident, that this was not purposeful. Like you can't prove or it would be very difficult to prove that she did this on purpose. According to Dr. Ian Musgrave, who's a molecular pharmacologist at the University of Adelaide, death cap mushrooms contain three broad classes of toxins, the amatoxins, the phalotoxins, and the virotoxins. The most toxic of these is an amatoxin known as a amatin. Amatoxins inhibit an enzyme called RNA polyarmis 2, and this prevents cells from carrying out essential functions such as creating proteins. And the, the weird thing about it is the toxins don't get killed or become less effective when they're heated up. So if you cook with them, it's not going to make them less poisonous or less lethal. And once a death cap is eaten, people are often asymptomatic for several hours before its effects become apparent. And that's nausea, diarrhea, other symptoms of gastrointestinal upset developing from about 6 to 12 hours after ingestion, though it may be sooner if the if a higher dose is ingested. So this is also another reason that death cap mushrooms are, you know, pretty good way to sort of accidentally kill somebody. Like you accidentally put them in there. It took a very long time for the symptoms to show. So something else could have happened between when they ate your food and when they were, became ill. It's actually a perfect crime if you think about it. And once these toxins get inside of your body, it's, it's pretty much just world domination, destruction. The primary site of that toxin is the liver, where it first travels after being absorbed from the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. It'll stop the liver from functioning, and then after a period of time, the liver will die. The toxin has that same effect on all the cells that it interacts with. Within one to seven days of ingestion, the death cap can result in liver failure, kidney failure, encephalopathy, and death. Now, there is no antidote, but there is a way to treat 
this poisoning if you get to it soon enough, which is hard because of the fact that there is this large dormant period where you don't have symptoms. And then also you can have these symptoms and then you can start to feel better, like your nausea and stuff will go away. And then you can feel fine for like up to 24 hours and then the symptoms come back. So often people will think they have food poisoning and then they'll start to feel better so they won't go to the hospital. And by the time they do, it is far too late. So there's a compound called psilocybin, and that can be used to treat death cap poisoning. It works by competitively binding to the same receptors in the liver that the toxin binds to, but it's only effective if administered before the toxin starts to irreversibly bind to cells, which may be before a person begins to show symptoms depending on the dose. So where does that leave us? Well, like I said, I... I'm on the fence as to whether or not Aaron Patterson did this on purpose. And if you asked me to lean one way or the other, I'd lean towards, yes, she she did do it on purpose. However, I think it's going to be incredibly difficult to prove. They are going to have to go in. They're going to have to find some motive, right? Motive means opportunity. These are things that you usually need to prosecute a crime. And the motive will maybe be found in text messages, email exchanges. Maybe Erin was emailing friends and talking about how much she hated her mother and father-in-law, how they're constantly interfering, how she wishes they would just go away. She wishes they would just die, you know, things like that. Things like that would be great um, supporting evidence for a purposeful poisoning. They It would be circumstantial still, but it would still be a better circumstantial case than what they have now, which is they really just can't prove that she picked them knowing they were poisonous. However, she did lie about it and she did get rid of the food dehydrator, which I think is a pretty a pretty strong sign of guilt, but either way, it still might be very difficult to prove. So, let me know what you think, but before we go, don't don't click off yet cuz we have Stephanie's small business showcase. Woo! I got to get like a theme song for that or something. So our small business today comes from Jillian. She says, hi, Stephanie. I absolutely adore you with this idea. Thank you, Jillian. She said, your videos keep me entertained while I paint for my small business, Studio 204. I paint custom portraits and lately have been specializing in memorializing family photos or photos of loved ones who are no longer here. Please feel free to check out my work on Instagram. So you should go to her Instagram. It's at Studio 204. I'll put up the handle here. And honestly, these are really cute, really nice signs. I love the fact that they have texture. They're three-dimensional. They're beautiful. She does nursery signs. It looks like she does signs for parties, like she did a sign for somebody's 30th um, 30th birthday party. Like I said, these signs have like a three-dimensional nature to them. Um, they stand out. I like the colors. They're beautiful. So you guys should go and check out Jillian's Instagram page, Studio 204. She's based out of Long Island, New York. Yeah, New York. And on her profile, there is a link you can click at the bottom where you can um, make a custom order, have her design something for you. Really cool stuff, really beautiful things. I love them. I love her Instagram. Like, I I want her to, like, help me with my Instagram because it's, like, perfectly set up. But anyways, um, beautiful beautiful stuff. Go check out Jillian's paintings at Studio 204. Now I'll put the links in the description box. And yeah, that's today's small business showcase. Shout out. Yes, alliteration. Anyways, I'm going to wrap this up now. Let me know what you think about this case in the comments section. Are you leaning more towards accident? Are you leaning more towards intentional? What do you think about Erin's initial statement when she talked to the police shortly after her in-laws died where she really looked like she was trying to cry and seemed to be in a state of just complete distraughtness. I'm sure that's not a word, but, you know, she like it appeared to be completely distraught, but it wasn't just like selling, you know, it was, it was kind of falling flat for me. So let me know what you think in the comment section. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I will see you very, very soon. Let's get it.
loving you slowly So you got to let it go I got blood, blood on the strings 